Every year in the United States, we collectively drive about three and a half trillion miles. Every single one of those miles are made possible by the hundreds of rotating parts that enable a vehicle to drive down the road. Roller bearings, ball bearings, journals, shafts, gears, pulleys, and sprockets are all descendants of the wheel. The wheel is often praised as man's first invention, but it's actually an emergent device, conceived of an idea much more profound and integral to the evolution of civilization. Let's say we wanted to lift a thousand pound rock, but at best, we're only able to generate 200 pounds of force. If we take a pole and position it over a pivot point or a fulcrum so that the side we apply force to is five times longer than the lifting side, we can now lift our rock. This simple idea is the basis of mankind's first simple machine, the lever. Known as mechanical advantage or leverage, the lever allows us to trade distance of travel for force. If we take the fulcrum point of our lever and move it completely over to one end, duplicate it repeatedly with each copy sharing the same fulcrum, a new simple machine is formed, the wheel. Wheels allow us to multiply distance, speed, or force based on how much leverage we put on their center point. A wheel usually mounts to a shaft at its center called an axle. If the axle is fixed to the wheel, rotational force known as torque can be transmitted to or from the wheel. Much like a lever, if we make the wheel larger in diameter, we can create more torque at its center point at the cost of having the outer edge of the wheel traversing a longer distance. Conversely, if we apply the torque at the center point, the wheel diameter determines how much distance the wheel can travel forward in one rotation. If we link two wheels together by a belt, chain, or a force transmitting feature such as teeth, we create a pulley, sprocket, or a gear. Linking wheels together allow us to multiply torque to rotational speed and vice versa in predetermined ratios. In this example, wheel A is twice the diameter of wheel B. They're linked in a two to one ratio. In order to rotate wheel A once, we need to rotate wheel B twice. This doubles the torque at wheel B's axle at the cost of requiring two rotations. In the opposite direction, it only takes half a turn of wheel A to make wheel B rotate once. The torque applied is half, but it rotates faster. Machines that link wheels together for the purposes of converting between torque and speed are sometimes called gearboxes or transmissions. Wheels provide another characteristic that has been critical to industrial growth. If we look at an example of a perfect wheel rolling down a road, the forces that are transmitted between the wheel and the road transmit at one point. The majority of the wheel's circumference never make contact with the road. This characteristic of reducing material contact to a small area allows wheels to operate as friction reducing elements. This characteristic forms the basis for bearings. In order for wheels and their modern industrial analogs to perform effectively and reliably, especially at higher speeds, smooth rotation with exacting dimensional control is key. Pushing forward this constant reinvention of the wheel in order to advance modern industry is the science of roundness. Roundness, along with size, play critical roles in how parts are specified, designed, and fitted. However, roundness diverts from the standard methods of defining dimensions, such as length, area, and volume. Roundness is more of a relationship between dimensions, and must be measured in a completely different manner. The measure of roundness, as well as other metrics of dimensionality, is known as metrology the scientific study of measurement. In order to measure roundness, we need to quantify what roundness actually is. If we look at a perfectly round circle and try to determine what makes it perfectly round, we observe that it maintains the same diameter no matter how we measure it. It has a constant diameter, but this doesn't constitute roundness. 
Rouleau polygons are a group of curvilinear polygons built up of circular arcs that have constant diameters but are by all intuitive means not round. Constant diameter is a prerequisite to roundness, but it's not an indicator of roundness. Let's look at a perfect circle and another constant diameter shape and determine what makes one more round than the other. If we first draw a circle that fully encompasses the entire shape, we have what's known as a circumscribed circle. For the perfectly round circle, this is the circle itself. Next, we draw the largest circle that can be contained by the shape. This is known as an inscribed circle. For the perfectly round circle, this is again the circle itself. From the overlaid circles, we observe that roundness is defined by the relationship between the circumscribed circle and the inscribed circle. A perfectly round circle has no difference between the two overlay circles. As a shape become less round, the diameter difference between both overlay circles become larger. It should be noted that the technical definition of roundness describes overall shape and is not based on the radial distance from a common center point. Rollers and ball bearings are examples of roundness with no defined center point. However, in practice, roundness relative to a center axis is required both in engineering requirements and for the purposes of measurement. Gears, pulleys, sprockets, wheels, and other force transmitting rotating assemblies are generally designed around the center axis. The ability to verify the roundness of a part is absolutely critical to a component's performance. These components often function with friction and vibration in mind as systematic failure of moving components can occur if specifications aren't met. Measuring a part's roundness can be classified into two categories of measurement methods, intrinsic datum reference and extrinsic datum reference. A datum reference or datum is an important feature of a part such as a point, line, plane, hole, set of holes, or a pair of surfaces. Datums serve as a reference in defining the geometry of a part and are used in measuring the geometry. Datums can be used to determine how closely a part matches a specified value. In the intrinsic datum method, the datum points used for measurement are directly taken off the part and its contact points with a reference surface. Typically a flat surface is used for a single datum measurement or a v-block for a two datum measurement. A measurement device that measures the displacement of the surface, such as a dial indicator, is brought to the surface of the part and zero to a start point. As the part is rotated, deviations from roundness displaces the measurement tool from the zero, with surface peaks creating positive displacement and valleys negative ones. A perfectly round part will never displace the measurement tool throughout a full rotation. On parts that are not round, the measured difference between the lowest surface valley and the highest surface peak throughout a rotation is known as its total indicated runout or runout. Runout is a simple indicator of a part's roundness. It's often used as a quality check to verify a part's usability, but may not indicate how a part will function or provide any useful information for the purposes of refining manufacturing of the part. Runout checks are often specified in the servicing of rotating machines such as engines, tools, and mechanical power transmission assemblies. They provide a simple go-no-go no go test for the infuel servicing of components. What do runouts feel like in practice? Simple hand-use items such as doorknobs and rolling pins usually have large runouts in the 132nd of an inch to 1 8th of an inch range. Cheap power tools and lower quality general use parts have rotating component runouts in the hundredth of an inch range. More precise components such as engine crankshafts typically have runout specs for their journals at a thousandth of an inch or less. On machine tools, critical rotating assembly runouts approach one ten thousandth of an inch. Even more astonishing, some of the most round mass-produced components, grade three ball bearings, have a sphericity, a three-dimensional analog of roundness of three millionths of an inch. 
This is a displacement equivalent to about 750 hydrogen atoms. If a 1 inch grade 3 ball bearing was scaled up to the size of the earth, the difference between the deepest depth of the ocean and the tallest mountain peak would only be 125 feet. The intrinsic data method, while relatively easier to accomplish, suffers from certain limitations. Its setup can be difficult as it relies on reference surfaces. Using a single datum surface can create issues with mounting and positioning, and the two datum method can be problematic if appropriate V angles aren't used. Even more limiting is the difficulty in measuring round parts with surface features or larger deformations. For example, if we attempt to measure the roundness of a gear, the depth, spacing, and shape of its teeth present an obstacle to measuring its true roundness. Its measured runout stops reflecting the part's roundness and becomes a false measurement based on its surface features. In addition, this method offers no means of testing roundness relative to an axis of rotation. The solutions to the limitations of the intrinsic datum method is extrinsic datum measurement. Extrinsic datum measurement is done by assigning a rotational axis datum to the part and aligning it to the circular datum of a highly accurate rotating measuring fixture. This is often a table mounted to a spindle that allows for centering and leveling of the part. During rotation, a transducer measures radial variations on the surface of the part with respect to the spindle's axis. Limited only by the precision of the spindle and transducer gauge head, the extrinsic datum method can be used for the most extreme roundness specifications and parts with complex surface features. It is also suitable for both internal and external roundness measurement due to the flexibility of the fixturing. The method in which measurement data is processed from the extrinsic datum method offers more insight into the part's performance and can help aid in refining manufacturing. The resultant data is represented as radial variations on a polar graph. This graph is then used to calculate a reference circle and its deviation from reference roundness. The least square reference circle, the most commonly used reference circle, is a circle that equally divides the area between the inside and outside of the reference circle. Out of roundness is then presented in terms of the maximum displacement from the reference circle, the difference between the highest peak to the lowest valley. A minimum zone reference circle is derived by first calculating the smallest circle that can fit inside of the measured data. Next, the smallest circle that can encompass the measured data is calculated. The out of roundness is given by the radial separation between these two circles that enclose the data. A minimum circumscribed reference circle, sometimes known as the ring gauge reference circle, is the smallest circle that totally encloses the data. Out of roundness is quantified as the largest deviation from this circle. A maximum inscribed reference circle is the largest circle that can be enclosed by the data. The out of roundness is quantified as the maximum deviation of the data from this circle. This is sometimes known as the plug gauge reference circle. When rotating parts are examined, especially by extrinsic measurement, harmonics of the part become a consideration. Irregularities that exist on a rotating part are known as undulations. An example of this is ovality, which indicates an irregularity that occurs two times in one complete revolution. The part has two lobes or two undulations per revolution. An even or odd number of lobes may be present on a part contributing to a problem of fit with mating parts. High order lobing, often caused by tooling chatter, vibration, and processing marks, are generally more important to the function than to the fit of a part. By filtering the frequency of undulations per revolution in the measured data, the properties of these harmonics can be analyzed. Instrument and workpiece setup may contribute to low frequency harmonics while machining and process effects, as well as material rigidity, may contribute to higher frequency harmonic effects. In 2011, the International Community for Weights and Measures spearheaded an effort to redefine the kilogram, moving it away from antiquated reference objects. One proposal, pushed by an international team called the Avogadro Project, 
aim to define the kilogram in terms of a specific number of silicon atoms. In order to count the atoms of the large silicon 28 crystal, it was ground into a ball and its volume determined. For this to work effectively, the ball had to be ground as accurately as possible and thus the world's roundest object was created. After months of polishing, the team produced two spheres with a diameter of 93.75 millimeters. The small scale roughness of the balls varies by only a third of a nanometer or two silicon atoms and the runout of only 60 to 70 nanometers or about 300 silicon atoms. Achim Leisner, an optical engineer on the project, has stated, if you were to blow up our spheres to the size of the earth, you would see a small ripple in the smoothness of about 12 to 15 millimeters and a variation of only three to five meters in the roundness. Moving past man-made objects, let's look at the roundest object ever measured. In 2013, in an effort to study the distribution of charge around the electron, scientists at Harvard were able to measure the smallest roundness ever. The roundness of charge distribution was so minuscule that if the electron were a sphere the size of the Earth, the out of roundness of this data would be the equivalent to shaving less than 2 nanometers or about 20 hydrogen atoms off the North Pole and pasting it onto the South Pole. At this scale, we're at the limits of what we can consider tangible roundness. At the subatomic level, objects become intuitively sizeless and our measurements become statistical data representing the distribution of subatomic properties.